Okay, welcome everyone. Last but one week of CX 246. Uh, first of all, a couple of announcements. Uh, Omer 4 deadline is tonight at midnight. Uh, congrats for all of you who endured till the very end with all the long assignments. We are aware that they are advanced, but they're also very exciting. And next week on Thursday, we're gonna be having a review session of the whole course, which I believe is gonna be extremely useful for the final exam. And we're also gonna be releasing a few final exams from the past years that you can use as training material. So stay tuned on Piazza and you know, we're gonna be giving you all the tools required to haze the final exam, okay? Perfect. So today we're gonna be talking about learning through experimentation, which is basically the continuation of Tuesday lecture that was covering web advertising. And the reason is, the reason why we care in general about learning through experimentation is that we should not only focus on ads. Like this, the kind of techniques that we saw on Tuesday and we're gonna be talking about today as well, they do apply in general whenever you wanna be testing multiple uh, settings or multiple different configuration of your website, let's say. Uh, so uh, at, the, at the end of this lecture, I'm gonna be giving you basically some of the tools and techniques uh, to deal with these uh, different problems. So uh, let's conduct first of all with web advertising. So what we discussed on Tuesday, on Tuesday was basically how to match advertisers uh, to queries in real time, okay? So we wanted to find the best possible ads relevant uh, for a specific user. But what we did not discuss there was how do we estimate the click-through rate? So how do we figure out how often a certain user is gonna click on that ad? And similarly, here we're we going back a few weeks, we also talked about recommendation engines, and then when we were talking about you know, how to build them, we also highlighted this uh, big issue uh, of the cold start problem. So the, as a reminder, the cold start problem is this, um, is basically whenever you have new items on your system or new users joining your platform, you have very scarce information about that item. So how do you recommend it? That's why it's called cold start because you have no data about that, uh, that item. So uh, how can you match it to the best possible user in your platform, okay? So you're Netflix, you have a new series, a new movie. How are you gonna recommend it, okay? So, and we're gonna be basically drawing a link between these two different problems. The reason is, if you think about web advertising, there are a lot of new ads you know, going on Google on, on a daily basis. So how do they match those ads to the best possible users in their, in their platform, okay? So the goal of today is how do we run experiments to gather as quickly as possible information about ads or items that will then allow us to perform the best possible recommendations, okay? And the idea is, Whenever an ad is shown or a product is recommended, we can gather more data about that item. And the reason is both when there are clicks, so both when the user shows some interest for that item, but also when the item or the ad is ignored, we do gather some information, okay? So like you're on Google, you have this set of ads on the right, and if you're consistently ignoring them, then Google gets a signal that probably those ads are not relevant or they're not interesting, okay? Conversely, if you click through them, then Google gets, again, this signal that uh, will boost them up in their own rankings, okay? So as you, can, as you can, the intuition here is that every time these platforms are running live, rather than consider them as a you know, static system, you can imagine them as a, a run, always running experiment, basically, okay? So every time there is user interaction, you can, you, you can leverage this interaction as a running experiment, gather useful information, and then make decisions based on that. Okay, so let's go to the web advertising example that we've seen on Tuesday and let's try to make it a bit more advanced, okay? So your company, your Google, you are you know, one of the many companies here in the Valley that are uh, sustained through ads. What is your goal? It's to maximize revenues, right? So you wanna show as many ads as possible. You wanna make sure that people click through them, convert, become users, pay subscriptions and so forth, okay? So the old way to deal with advertisement was to paying by impression, okay? The, the old CPM style. And paying by impression means that every time you're showing an ad on your platform, you're gonna be asking money uh, from the person who's buying those ads. And keep in mind that this 
you know, this paradigm is not only uh, coming from the web world. You know, this is a much older paradigm, the fact that you're paying by impression. If you think about it, newspapers work in that way, uh, billboards work in that way. The larger is the billboard that you buy, you know, in, on the 101 or in LA on a big building, then you will be paying more money because the impression is, you know, is more lasting because people can see it much easier. And in that case, what is the best strategy for the, you know, for the person who provides the ads? It's just going with the highest bidder, okay? So if, if you have multiple entities that are willing to pay you a certain amount of money for, uh, for your space, let's say on a billboard, then you're just gonna be accepting the person who's willing to pay the most, okay? That's how you maximize your revenues. The reason why that, you know, this paradigm was not, uh, has been revolutionized by the web is, is the fact that it's very hard to assess what is the effectiveness of those ads. You know, you just know that they're on the newspaper, or they're shown on the 101, but you don't know how many people are gonna be paying attention to them, okay? So the new way, or the, the web way that revolutionized the advertisement industry is to pay per click, okay? So our CPC. And there, the, the best strategy to maximize your revenue is to basically being able to compute what is the expected revenue. And your expected revenue is basically a function of not only the ad, but also the query that is gonna be performed by the user on your platform, okay? So we wanna estimate how often those ads are gonna be clicked on, all right? So basically our estimated revenue, as we said, is probability of clicking on an ad condition on a specific query, times the amount that uh, the company is willing to pay for that ad, okay? And the problem with this very simple equation is the fact that our right side, the amount, is known, okay? So the bid amount for an ad A uh, given the query Q is known because we are bidding for that, right? Conversely, this probability here is unknown. So the probability that a user will be clicking on a specific ad is, is unknown. We don't know, we have basically to test it over time, okay? And the idea here is, as we were saying before, we're gonna be showing this ad and then we're gonna be logging all the user actions and we're gonna be able to figure out what is the conditional probability here, okay? So this is the core of what we're gonna be talking about today. And just to give an idea of how big this industry is, I was checking Mm. an article before coming here to give this lecture, just you know, to give a, a, a reasonable number, and we are talking about roughly $1.2 trillion, okay? So that's, that's a gigantic industry, and you can imagine that every optimization that you can do here uh, for maximizing your revenues, if you're a company based on ads, means that you're splitting a very large pie, okay? So that's why there are many people working on this problem on a daily basis. Now, what are the other applications, okay? Let's, let's not talk only about ads because everyone does that in, in the Valley. Uh, let's see also where these kind of techniques we're gonna be talking about today can be applied. Uh, first example is you can apply them on, clin on clinical trials. So the idea is that in a clinical trial, what you do is you try to investigate what are the effects of different treatments. And at the same time, you also wanna minimize the adverse effects on the patients, right? So you're, you're testing new uh, medications, you're testing new uh, surgery techniques. You wanna make sure that uh, you, you have a, both a treatment and a control group, but at the same time, you don't want to have adverse effect on the people that are receiving those treatments. Um, a totally different example, but still applies very well, is if you think about the networking world, uh, the network, networking world, so for instance, the, uh, the internet that goes all around the globe, um, the idea there is that it's a best effort architecture. There are no you know, fixed routing schemes. The, the packet routing is not deterministic. So what we do every time you, know, you send a packet online is there is an adaptive routing going on, okay? So every time you know, uh, a network connection falls, packet has to be rerouted and so forth. So the idea there is that you wanna minimize the delay in the network by investigating different routes. You don't wanna have a fixed route that goes from point A to point B, okay? You always wanna keep trying testing other possible routes in case something happens, or simply if a route becomes faster, you wanna find that out over time, okay? So this is an example based on networking. Uh, last but not the least, you can think about asset pricing, which is usually a very big problem for every startup, you know, every new company appearing on pretty much uh, every different kind of market. So how do you figure out your product price, okay? Well, once you know the cost of, on how much cost you have for making a certain item, you know, in your, in your catalog. How do you, how do you price that product in the right way, okay? So you, you wanna basically 
test it. You want to test different price points. And then eventually, again, what you want to do is you want to try to maximize your revenue. So you want to make the most possible money, right? So no, rather than running your product at a specific pricing point for three months and then making a decision if you should increase it or lower it, you want to be testing you know, different, uh, different pricing points at the same time and figuring out which one sells the most and which one sells the least, okay? How do we attack this problem? So today we're going to be talking about bandits, uh, not comic book bandits, but rather the multi-arm bandits. So we went from bandits to octopus. <laughs> but the idea here is that, so we have these very cute octopus playing slot machines in Vegas. And as any person who is addicted on gambling, our octopus is playing multiple slot machines at the same time. And the reason why this whole set of the techniques is called bandits is because we all know that gambling in general robs money from people, right? So uh, what we're gonna be trying to do today is to minimize how much money this gambling is gonna be robbing from us, okay? So what is the setting of the K-Arm Bandit? How does it work? So we have our slot machine, and the only variation is the fact that rather than having just one arm, it's gonna be having multiple arms, okay? Or you can think about your this person in Vegas who squats you know, between five different slot machines and they try to use all of them at the same time, okay? So let's say you have five slot machines and you wanna use all of them at the same time. And how do we characterize our harms? So each harm A as could even win, so it gives you one coin, a reward one, and this comes with a fixed but unknown probability, which we're gonna be calling mu A, or it can lose. So it gives you zero coins, reward zero. Again, this is a fixed unknown probability and clearly is the reciprocal is one minus uh, mu of A. And another important assumption is that all our draws are independent, okay? So basically, to each harm, we can assign a different uh, win probability, okay? The problem here is, how do we pull our harms to maximize the total reward, okay? Now start to think about the mapping between how ads work and how we are defining this problem, okay? So how do we map it? Basically, each query is a bandit, so each query is a different set of slot machines that we are playing with, and then each ad is an arm. So what we're doing here is you, get a, you, you send a query to the system, and the system returns a slot machine, and the slot machine can show you different ads, okay? And pulling an arm and getting a reward means that the user has clicked on that ad, okay? So that's how you map the web advertising world to the uh, multi-harm bandit problem. So what we wanna do is to estimate the arm's probability of winning, okay? Our move A, which again, in the context of the ads can be seen as the click-through rate, okay? And the intuition here is that every time we pull an arm, we do an experiment, okay? So we are not only logging if the user clicked or not through that HUD, but we're also using all this information to basically make our system more aware of which HUDs are liked by people and which HUDs are ignored by people. And then based on this, we're gonna be slowly optimizing our strategy of what are the ads that we show and what are the HUDs that we eventually hide, okay? Perfect, so let's formalize the setting, okay? So this is called the stochastic K arm bandit. The, sandi, the setting is the following. So K will be throughout the whole lecture our uh, number of arms. So we have basically K choices. And each choice A is associated with an unknown probability distribution that basically goes from zero to one, okay? And we're gonna be playing the game for T rounds. So T is our time variable, okay? And at each round T, we do the following. We decide to pick an arm A, and then we obtain a random sample X sub T from our probability distribution, okay? And once again, let's remind each other that the rewards are independent of the previous draws, okay? I, I cannot tell you for sure if this applies to slot machines. Uh, I think these details are from Vegas and uh, we're not allowed to know. But in general, for our setting, uh, every time you're clicking or not on an ad, we, we take into account the fact that it's independent of what has been shown before to the user, okay? And uh, simply, basically, we wanna maximize the sum of all the possible rewards over the time t that we're running the experiments, okay? What is missing here? 
we still don't know our mu of A, right? We don't know what is the win rate of the specific arm that we picked, okay? But now every time we're pulling the arm A, we get to learn a bit more about mu of A, okay? So basically, here is what we were discussing before with the gold star problem. As soon as you're given this new set of slot machines, you don't know anything about each one of the arms, okay? So we're in front of the standard classic, uh, in front of the classic gold star problem. But then as soon as we start to pull the arm, then we start to gather some information. Basically what we're doing is, the more we pull the arm, the more we are uh, estimating what is the probability distribution for that arm, okay? And eventually this will converge into our value mu of A, that we're interested about. So let's go through, through an example, okay? So this is over time, as you can see here. This is our choice of arms, so we have k arms in total, and these are all the outcomes, okay? So you start with slot machine number two, then you jump to k, then you see, okay, number two has, give me, has given me a reward, so I'm gonna try once again, you get a zero, you jump to one, and you get a couple of rewards, and you go forward, okay? So basically what we're doing is, this is an optimization algorithm, but it's online because we don't have all the input at a given time t and we can analyze it. We actually have to analyze it at each single step, all right? So like any other online algorithms that we've seen also in the, in the past week, uh, we have to make a choice each time. So at each time we have more information about the system, therefore we can make a more informed choice. And the shortcoming here is that we're receiving information about only the chosen action. So Whenever I'm picking, you know, A2, I'm not gathering additional information about A1. So my probability, the estimate of my probability distribution for A1 is unchanged, okay? So basically, we're gonna be talking about this exploitation versus exploration trade-off, all right? So the idea that if you trust A2 and you keep on drawing that arm because you know that it gives you more rewards, uh, you will not be exploring the potential of the other arms. Question? Or an arm? The, the, the row encodes a, an arm. So the, the query, is, the query is, your, is your setting. The query gives you this table, okay? And then these are all the different ads that you can be showing for that query. And each query would have a different table. Each query will have a different table, exactly. So that's why it's, it's multi-arm bandit, and if you make it bandits, then you get your whole uh, experiment on the system, okay? <coughs> queries or different tables share the same row? What we're going to be seeing today, no. Every query is a separate entity. Uh, there is additional literature that shows that, you know, when two queries are semantically close to each other, then you can, you know, gather some information from the table and transfer it to the other one, but uh, we're not going to be able to cover that today, yes. Very good question, thanks. And what's X? What are the X's? Oh, X is the outcome. So at, at time one, basically, the A2 gave you a reward zero, so it didn't give you the coin. At uh, time three, it gave you the coin, okay? Perfect. And it's a binary matrix because we're just keeping into account the click-through rate now. So the, uh, the options are just to click or not click, okay? Thanks. Okay, so how do we solve our bandit problem? Basically, what we're looking for is a, is a strategy that at each iteration will tell me which arm to pull, okay? And our policy hopefully will depend on the history of the rewards, right? So for those of you who are taking reinforcement learning courses or are gonna do them, this is basically a reinforcement learning problem, okay? We, are, we, we have an agent and we're trying to learn a policy for that agent. So I'm trying to draw a parallel between these two fields, okay? And so how do we quantify the performance of the algorithm? Basically, we're gonna be computing a quantity that we call regret. And intuitively, the regret is, if you know that there is one arm of the slot machine that gives you consistently more money, you should be always using that arm, right? Now, this is based on the assumption that we knew uh, all the probability distributions. We don't, so we're gonna be trying to estimate them as fast as possible, such that we minimize our regret, okay? So we minimize how much money we are losing in this experiment. So, how do we compute our regret? Let's make it more formal, okay? So, our mu of A 
is basically the, the mean of the probability distribution. So we take all the possible outcomes and then we take, we take the mean. And the, the, the reward of our best term is our mu star, which is nothing but the max among all the possible mu parameters, okay? So we're gonna be picking the, the max one there. And then we pull different arms uh, until time t, and at each time step, we can compute what is the instantaneous regret, okay? So the instantaneous regret at time t is nothing but the difference between the best possible outcome that you get from mu star, so our max, minus the, the mu of a, so the arm that you picked, at time t. And how do you compute the total regret? You just do a sum uh, over all the time steps that we are taking into account in our experiment, okay? So, the goal, what we're gonna be trying to solve today is we wanna find a policy, which is nothing but you know, an arm allocation strategy, so picking which arm you want to pull, that guarantees that as, t, as time goes to infinite, our regret is going to zero. So, we wanna make sure that the, the, the division between the, 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 the total regret divided by the length of your experiment goes to zero. And here it's interesting to note that this kind of, uh, uh, let's say the, the, the kind of uh, minimization that we're trying to do is stricter compared to what we talked about before. So we're we are not just trying to maximize the revenue or minimizing the regret, but actually we're, we're trying to find what is the best hand, what is the best possible strategy, because we're making this quantity go to zero, okay? So basically over time, eventually, the regret will be so small and it will be paid just at the beginning that it dilutes over the whole duration of the experiment, and then this quantity goes to zero, okay? So we're actually solving a stricter problem than just trying to minimize the regret. So, if you knew all the payoffs or our harms, the strategy will be trivial, right? We will be picking always the max, okay? We will always be picking the, the best mu among all the possible arms. Now, what if we only said care about estimating the, the payoffs, okay? Because actually at the very beginning when we just kickstart the system, that's the only thing we can afford to do. We don't know all the mu's, so we want to estimate them. So what we do is, we pick each of the k arms equally often. So basically, we, we do a round robin during the uh, over the duration of the experiment. So we give it a t divided by k a number of, of, of pools. And how do we compute our estimate? So it's nothing but the average over all the returns that we get, okay? So this is, this is the variable that encodes our coin return. If we win, it's a one. If we lose, it's a zero, okay? So we just take the average over them and conversely, the regret is gonna be computed once again as a sum over all the possible arms. And here again, we're gonna be using the difference between the best possible strategy, our mustar, minus the estimate for our arm A, okay? So these are the two main quantities that we're gonna be dealing with. Let's try then to solve this problem, okay? So let's go with the, with the first technique. So we said that the regret is defined in terms of the, of the average reward. So if we can estimate the average reward, then we can also minimize the regret, right? These two, these two quantities are uh, connected. And the first algorithm that can come to your mind is a greedy algorithm, okay? So what you do is you always take the action with the highest average reward. So let's, let's go to an example, let's think about it. Okay, so we make it easy, we make k equal two, so we have two different actions, and we know that the action one, reward one with probability 0 0.3, and action two has reward one with probability 0 0.7, okay? So arm two appears to be strictly better than arm one, right? Now let's see what happens. You play a one, and you get a reward of one. You play a two instead, and you get a reward of zero. What do you think happens here? Yep. Probability estimates, so you give A1 more weight and A2 less weight. Exactly, perfect, great answer. So you, after you played A1 and A2, you're gonna be updating your estimates, and it turns out that your estimate for A1 will be equal to one, your estimate for A2 will be equal to zero. So we reached a standpoint where the, uh, the average reward of A1 will never drop to zero, while the, um, and therefore you will never be playing action A2 again. So this is a pathological example, it's a, it's a very small one, but 
it highlights one of the main shortcomings of the greedy algorithm, that it can basically converge into a solution that is not optimal, okay? So, and this is not uncommon in decision making. It's a, it's a very classic problem. And as I was mentioning before, whenever you're making a decision, you wanna be finding a trade-off between the exploration part when you're gathering data about the arm payoffs and the exploitation, which is making decisions based on the data that you already gathered. Question. Uh, in terms of which arm we decide to choose, I'm assuming that we're doing it stochastically, mm -hmm. not deterministically. In the example that we saw before, at the beginning, you basically draw each one of them. I'm just saying in the exploitation, exploitation case. Oh, we're going to be seeing different techniques today. In some of them is deterministic, in some of them is not. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so now we know that we have this trade-off, and the problem with the greedy algorithm is that we went very quickly from the exploration phase, where we pulled the, two, the arm one and, and arm two, to the exploitation one, because then we got stuck always using A1, even though we know that eventually the return will be lower because the probability was lower, okay? So the issue with the greedy algorithm, therefore, is that it does not explore sufficiently the, the, the space, okay? And to make it more realistic, basically the exploration is whenever you pull an arm that you never pulled before, and the exploitation is that when you keep on pulling arm A that has currently the higher highest estimate for mu of A, okay? So once you know that in your system there is one arm with, that has the highest possible payoff, you keep on playing, uh, pulling that arm, okay? All right, so now that we highlighted what is the problem with greedy, let's try to jump uh, to something that can overcome getting stuck in a local sub uh, in, a, in a local minimal right away. So the idea here is working on a variation of the greedy algorithm that is called the epsilon greedy. And the variation works in the following way. So we're still running our experiment, uh, capital T number of steps, but what we add to the equation is our parameter epsilon that depends on T. And our, t is, our epsilon of T is in the order of one divided by the time, okay? So the interesting, aspect about that parameter is that it decays over time. It becomes smaller and smaller the longer is the duration of the experiment. So what we do in this variation is that with probability epsilon of t, we explore by, kicking, by picking an arm chosen uniformly at random, okay? So this answer your question is basically a stochastic draw among all the different arms that you have available, okay? Conversely, with probability one minus epsilon of t, we keep on exploiting by picking the harm that has the highest possible reward, okay? Now, in this paper, is, you know, there is a theorem that proves that if you choose epsilon of t in a suitable way, in the right way, then this nice, nice property holds. So our, our total regret with the right choice of epsilon of t is in the order of k log t. So if we try to compute, you know, you remember that we were trying to bring this quantity to zero, right? So our total regret divided by the duration of the experiment. And if we substitute this quantity, so we do basically it's in the order of k log t divided by t, then we know that this limit goes to zero because log t divided by t goes to zero, okay? So we, we solved our minimization problem in this way. Not so fast, okay? So now I'm gonna show you why in reality this approach is not used uh, all the time. So, what are some of the issues with our epsilon greedy algorithm? The first one is, it's not very elegant. Basically what it does is, it, it interleaves uh, and these joint phases and one of them is about exploration and the other one is about exploitation, okay? So there are some phases where it's just exploring different options. As we said before, it's basically uh, picking different arms uh, stochastically, uniformly at random, and then in the other phase is just exploiting and always betting on the arm that gives the best possible reward. But apart from that, there is a more important fundamental problem, which is even the exploration phase can make suboptimal choices, okay? Since it's basically picking any arm equally likely. Why do you think this is a problem, okay? Think about it for a second. Anyone wants to give a try? So why the fact that it's picking the arms in the exploration phase 
uh, randomly is suboptimal. Yeah. If you picked one arm and every, like, if you draw from one arm a hundred times already and every time it's been zero, you probably don't want to continue trying to explore that one. Perfect. Okay. Great answer. I'm, I'm going to just rephrase it. Basically, the answer is, if you have already information about an arm, if you already know that an arm has an estimate that is very low, why would you keep on, you know, using that in your exploration phase? The problem here with the epsilon grid is that your exploration phase is not informed. All the, you know, different draws of the arms that we gather uh, before time t are basically ignored, okay? So we can do better. The epsilon greedy doesn't face the issue of getting stuck like the standard greedy algorithm, but we know that by ignoring that information, there is something else that we can leverage in order to get even better performance, okay? So the idea is exploring exploder and exploiting need to compare the uh, estimate outcomes of the different arms. So how do, we, how do we compare the arms, okay? So let's go with this very simple example. Now instead of two, we have just three arms. And for some of them, we have quite a lot of values, okay? So for arm one, we know that five times out of 10, we get a, we get a positive outcome. For arm two, we just have one instance, but we know that it was a positive one. And then for arm three, we know that we get, uh, we get the coin eight times out of 10. Which arm would you pick? Next, and how would you make your choice? Anyone wants to try? So the, the, the key aspect here to consider is the denominator of these quantities. The fact that for some arms, we have quite a lot of data points, but for arm two, we have just one data point. So if we do our payoff estimate, arm two will be the winning option, right? Because it's one over one. So ideally we will keep on exploiting arm two. But in reality, the confidence attached to this value is very low because we only did one draw, right? And we have a much better confidence about the estimates instead for arm one and arm three. So this is the key inside that we want to exploit, okay? So we don't wanna just look at the mean, so the expected payoff, but we also wanna take into account the confidence of our expected payoff, okay? So let's try to plug in now the confidence and see how it makes our framework more powerful. Okay, so how do we, do, how do we use confidence intervals, okay? So confidence interval, we can define it basically as a, a range of values within which we are sure that the mean lies with a certain probability, okay? So if we know that, uh, the, say the, the mu of A, our mean is within 0 0.2 and 0 0.5, and the probability that this happens to be in that interval is 0 0.95, we are way more confident about this result than when our confidence value is like 0 0.5, okay? So that's the main insight that we care about uh, right now. And the, if we try to draw that arm less often, then our estimate will be less accurate and therefore the confidence interval will be much larger, okay? So the intuition here is, if you didn't pull the arm very often, then even if the, the estimate is very low, there is still potential in that arm. You don't know if eventually it's gonna be giving you a higher payoff, okay? While conversely, the more information you gather about an arm, the more the interval will shrink, okay? So after many rounds, you will start to, you know, be confident about the probability distribution assigned to that arm, okay? So how do we use uh, this, this information uh, to, to get better results, okay? So assume that uh, we, we know our confidence intervals. And what you can try to do is the following, basically. So instead of trying uh, the action with the highest mean, so this is what we were doing before, we estimated our mu values for each arm, and then in the exploitation phase, we were going with the arm that has the highest uh, mu value. What we do here is that we try the action with the highest upper bound on its confidence interval, okay? So, say our mean is here. So let's use our usual box plots. It's not really a box, <laughs> okay? We don't, you don't care only about the, the mean, you care about the upper bound, okay? And the reason is, basically we try to be optimistic. We say, if we do more draws from that arm, and it turns out that in reality, the, the mean will slowly uh, drift towards the upper bound that 
there is more potential from the DARM, so it should be exploited more, okay? So that's the intuition behind working with the confidence intervals rather than just with the estimates. And this is called an optimistic policy, okay? It's often used in the context of uh, greedy algorithms as well. And basically, it's, it's based on the belief that every action is gonna be as good as possible given the available evidence, all right? Let's try to see this with numbers and with a better drawing than what I have on the board, okay? So now we have some plots. <laughs> um, all right, so we start from here, okay? This is, this is uh, the different distribution just for, uh, for arm A, okay? So uh, one distribution will be the following. This is the median, and these are the, in the bounds of our confidence interval. And then we know that with you know, 99.99% confidence interval, uh, the upper bound of the blue bar is much higher. So rather than always going with the red one, because it's the one with the highest um, average reward, we're gonna be going with the blue one, okay? And now, after we do more exploration, it turns out that the confidence interval of the blue bar shrinks, okay? So we gather more information about this arm, and it, and it turns out that uh, we were too optimistic. So the, the average moves, but not, not that much, okay? And now we can go back to the, to the red arm, because we know that the upper bound is the highest, okay? So in this way, as you can see, we keep on gathering information, we keep on doing exploration until the confidence intervals are shrinking, and then eventually we have enough data for each single arm to make an informed decision of which one is the best, okay? So to translate this into ads, if you just have a new ad that arrives on your system, you show it only for one day, and it's not getting you know, plenty of clicks, you don't give up right away, okay? You keep on showing it, you keep on getting data, and then after you have a good estimate of what is the click-through rate for the dad, then you decide if it should be the one that is showed most often or not, okay? Otherwise, if you don't do this, data, you know, ads will, will tend to all disappear right away because there are some of them which are always used, which are already clicked by people. Question? To do some kind of like a Bayesian approach where you have a prior and then you're updating your belief. Perfect. <laughs> Great question. So the question is, how does this compare to a Bayesian approach? Uh, what we're going to be seeing at the end of the lecture is uh, we're going to be talking about Thompson sampling. We, I'm not going to explain it in terms of um, you know Bayesian approach, but you will see the parallel very easily. So there are basically different ways in which you can perform uh, sampling over the data, no? and one of them will be exactly to assign priors to the, to, the, to the different probabilities, and then the more draws you make, the more updates you make, and then your sampling will be more informed. Yeah. Great question, thanks. Okay, now, how do we calculate our confidence bounds, okay? So here is the deal. Um, we have our uh, variable y of uh, a1 to a m are the payoffs of our arm A in the first M trials, okay? So the duration of the trial is of M steps in total, okay? And our uh, Y variable are uh, random variables that can take values uh, between zero and one. So our, the, the mean payoff for arm, arm A is our mu of A, as we, as we have seen before, and how do we compute the estimate? Once again, it's nothing but the average over the sum of all the possible returns, of all the uh, positive returns that we're having during the M trials, okay? So what we wanna do is that we wanna find B, B is our bound, such that with high probability, the difference between the mu of A, the real one, and the estimate is less than the bound. And we want our bound to be as small as possible, right? Because we want our estimate to be as uh, reliable as possible, okay? So the goal is basically to uh, find what is the probability that uh, this difference is less than our uh, quantity B, so our bound B. How do we do this? So there is a very uh, elegant resulting probability theory called the Offdings of inequality. And what this inequality provides to us is basically an upper bound on the probability that the average deviates from the expected value by more than a certain amount, okay? So it's exactly what we need, what we were seeing before. We have the expected value of mu, and we have the, uh, the average that we're computing after M trials. We wanna know how much these two quantities are deviating from each other, okay? 
So once again, in the ideal world, we will know what is the value of uh, mu sub m hat because uh, it, it means that we knew already what was the estimate, but we don't know it, so we have to estimate it by running multiple trials, and we want to find out what is the difference between the actual value and the one that we are estimating, okay? So the trick here is the following. We take this inequality, which is expressed in the following way. So this is the probability that we were talking about before, the fact that uh, the, the difference between the, ex the, the real one and the expected is uh, larger than our bound. And we know that this probability is going to be less than two uh, times the, the heat elevated to minus two uh, b to the power two m, okay? And we can call this delta, which is going to be our confidence value, okay? So how do we go from this inequality, the Hoffdings inequality, into something actionable that you know, we, we can use for our computation? So what we find is that the confidence interval B, uh, which is going to be um, uh, basically connected to our uh, confidence level, so let's say our depth is 95% or 99%, that will turn into a specific value of B. So what we do is we take this quantity, right here, okay, which we, are, we wrote here, and then we want this quantity to be less or equal uh, than delta, okay? Then we just use standard uh, logarithm properties. We move this on the other side, so we got uh, two states there, then um, we bring the exponent on this side, and then the, uh, now we want to extract what is the value of b, so we're gonna be bringing the two on the other side, we're gonna be applying the square root so that we get b, the sign of the uh, inequality, the direction of the inequality changes, and then we get this final result of basically b has to be larger or equal than the logarithm of two divided by delta divided uh, uh, by two times m. And the interesting insight about this, qu this quantity is the following. So as you can see, the, the longer is the number of trials, the, the, the longer the experiment runs. Remember, m is our number of uh, trials that we saw from before, okay? First time trials. The bigger is this quantity, the smaller our bound will be, okay? So that's, that's what we were saying before. The more draws we do from a specific arm, the, the higher is the confidence that we have about the estimate for that probability. And uh, similarly, the bigger is the, is the confidence, is the confidence uh, level that we have. So the bigger is our death, the quantity for delta, the smaller uh, will be our uh, B, okay? So the more we want our confidence level to be high, the more our bound has to be strict, okay? So that we have our mu and our expected mu to be as close as possible to each other. Okay, questions until now? Perfect, let's go forward. So, now that we figured out how to apply it, so once again, this is our quantity, B is our upper bound, M is the number of times we play that action. So we do, we did the math uh, before to extract B. So what we can do is that we can set B to be equal to this quantity, okay? So it will be equal to square root of two times log of T divided by M. Uh, once again, M is the number of trials that we do on that specific R. So if we do that, then we're gonna be obtaining the following quantity. So our probability that the, our two mu's are uh, within this specific bound is gonna be less or equal than two uh, times t to the power of minus four. And the interesting factor, uh, the interesting fact about extracting this quantity is that as you can imagine, it converges to zero very quickly as time goes, okay? So time passes by and very quickly this bound will go very close to zero. Now what is the catch here? If we don't play the action A, so if we don't, if we basically forget that arm of the slot machine or if we stop showing a specific cut for a long amount of time, then our, up and bow, our upper bound B will increase, okay? And um, so it means that in this, with this strategy, we never permanently rule out a specific option, okay? So a certain arm of our slot machine will just not disappear completely from our experiment. We're gonna keep on pulling it every now and then to see if we can further update the estimate. And conversely, 
the probability the uh, upper bound is wrong is, de is decreasing with time t. So the more the, the experiment runs, the more time we pull the, the arm, and the, the, the smaller is going to be our bound, so the more confidence we're going to be having about the probability distribution for that specific arm. Okay, so if you want to convince yourself about these two results, um, okay, the reason why the probability of the upper bound decreases with time t, we have seen it, we have seen it here, okay, so it's two logs, uh, uh, two, uh, two times log t, and this is divided by the number of trials, so if the number of trials uh, goes down with time, basically this quantity is just increasing, okay, time passes by, you, we don't keep on testing the specific harm, okay? So the number of trials stays constant, then our bound is increasing, okay? Conversely, if you do more trials, this quantity is gonna be growing, and now our bound is gonna be decreasing, okay? So that's the intuition behind that. Now, why, apart from the fact that this gives a very elegant solution to the problem, it also captures another important aspect. So, Behavior of the users is, is not stationary. It's, it's, very, it's very unrealistic to model users as a stationary probability distribution, right? Because our taste changes over time. The ads that we care about might be changing after you know, two months, or the movies that we're watching change depending on the season, or on the mood, or on the taste, and so forth. So what this does, it pretty much captures the fact that every entity on the system introduces some kind of randomness, okay? So the idea that uh, a user that was ignoring specific HUD or even you know, a certain demographic that was ignoring a specific HUD might be changing their taste over time. So that's why we keep on running those tests, okay? So the bound keeps on increasing if the, the ad is not shown and eventually the ad will pop up again on Google and then Google will give it another run and will basically test if people are interested or not, okay? So it also captures basically this this interesting characteristic about users. Now, how do we use this concept of confidence bound? How do we plug it into our uh, multi-arm bandit problem uh, to make it uh, even more efficient? And this algorithm is called UCB1, and it stays for upper confidence sampling, upper confidence bound. The reason why it's called one, if you go on the original paper, there are multiple variants of this algorithm, okay? So today we're gonna be basically going through the, the main one, but then if you go through the paper, you will see also a bunch of different variations of that, okay? So how do we use it? Uh, we, we start by having, a, you know, um, uh, zero assignment on all the variables of the system. So we set to zero our uh, mu estimates and the number of trials, okay? So again, mu of a is our estimate of the payoffs for a specific arm A, and mu of a is the number of pulls that we're doing on that arm, and we run our experiment for T steps, okay? And for each arm A, what we do is that we calculate our upper bound. And the upper bound we calculate in the following way. So we know the estimate, okay, the, our mu of A. So we know what, after a few trials, we know more or less what is the expected success rate of the arm, plus alpha times the upper confidence interval that we computed from before, okay? So all the math that we've done before basically boils down to this, um, to this term here, okay? And then our strategy of the UCB will be the following. We basically pick the arm J, that will be the arg max among all the possible arms, okay? And then we pull our arm j, so the one associated to the highest possible return, and then we observe our y of t, which is the actual return. And the last step of UCB is updating this equation. So what do we do here? Uh, so we, we update our m of j, okay? So we do uh, plus one step, and then we're gonna be updating the the estimate for our mu of j. And the way in which we do it is the following. So let's go, let's split this equation so that you can follow easier. On the, on the right side, you would see m of j minus one times the uh, mu estimate. So this gives you basically, uh, it, it's just uh, on, all the step, on all the previous uh, m step, you're taking the, the average and you multiply it by all the number of steps. And then what you do is you, uh, you, you add the outcome for the last step, okay? So our y of t is the, uh, is the ob observation that we get at time t, and then once again, 
we compute the average, okay? So basically what we do is every time we have an observation, we are gonna be updating uh, the, the mu of j estimate for that, for that harm, okay? And one last interesting thing to uh, discuss about this uh, algorithm is this alpha parameter. So the alpha parameter is basically, it's something that encodes the trade-off between um, exploration and exploitation. So if you set alpha to zero, what do you think happens here? Sorry? There is no exploration, right? So you set alpha to zero, and then your peak is always based on the average estimates for that specific arm. What we actually do when we set alpha to zero, we turn this into the greedy strategy that we've seen at the very beginning, right? So we, we, we compute our estimates, then we go, we pick the best one, we update it, and we're back to that. So we, that, that's how we can nullify the, uh, the contribution of this term. Conversely, if we push alpha to a very large value, what we do is that we're gonna be doing mostly exploration. So what happens with actual you know, systems running in production is that the, the value of alpha is not our coded over a month or so. Like there is, you know, there is a data scientist and there is a team that is deciding the value of alpha over time, okay? So the more time goes by and once you're happy with your initial exploration phase, then you try to go more towards the, and the exploitation part, okay? So that's, that's why alpha is a, is a very uh, useful tunable in this approach. Any questions up to now? Okay, so let's discuss a bit more uh, the, the outcome of UCB. So, um, so our confidence interval grows with the total number of actions that we have taken, and this uh, we, we have seen before because uh, our M grows, so the bound becomes smaller. And um, at, at the same time is, basically this ensures that each harm is gonna be tried infinitely often, okay? But it still balances between exploration and exploitation. So this is the insight that I was explaining to you before when, when we said uh, we don't just ignore a, a nod or a certain arm of the slot machine forever after we know that the estimate is below a certain value. So we keep on getting back to that every now and then, okay? And what our alpha does here, it basically plays the role of our confidence interval. So if we, if we put alpha to zero, what we're saying is uh, we are sure that our estimates are correct. And conversely, if we make alpha very large, then we're saying that we don't trust our, uh, our estimates and then we keep on doing exploration until we have more information about, about each single arm, all right? Okay, so what we are doing here is basically, it's, um, what we encoded is a class of you know, strategies or is also almost a philosophical argument that um, we're trying to be bring in optimism in phase of uncertainty. So you could be having different kind of strategies, right? You could be way more, um, way more conservative and not trying to explore too much. Uh, but um, what we do here is basically, we believe that we can always obtain extra rewards by reaching unexplored parts of the state space, okay? Question. This is an online learning setting, correct? Correct, always online, yes. Yeah, it, it's online because, once again, we don't have the estimates uh, for the mu's for the different arms, so we have to collect it over time, and then we're basically learning the values over time. And as the parallel I was making before with reinforcement learning, you have an agent that has zero knowledge at the beginning. The more rounds you play, the more knowledge the agent gains and that it can make better choices, okay? Great. Okay, so I leave to you, you know, going around and check and definitely there are other version of this algorithm that are not based on complete optimism, but they tend to be more conservative, okay? But we like optimism, so I'm telling you about the most optimistic algorithm that we could find. Um, we're not gonna go through the math of this for, this, uh, for the sake of time. If you go back to the UCB paper, uh, they also prove uh, this, this interesting inequality. And basically what it tells us is that if you try to, you know, to compute the expectation of the total regret that we were talking about before, this will be uh, uh, less or equal to the, this, the following quantities. So 
this quantity will be in the order of k of uh, times the logarithm of t, so then the, the time, and the other quantity will be the order of k. So, oops, sorry. Uh, so it, it turns out that basically our, um, the ratio between the total regret and the amount of time we run our experiment is gonna be less or equal than k times logarithm of t divided by t. Once again, as we said before, this quantity, when time goes to infinite, goes to zero. So even, this, even the UCB1 technique matches the, the, the criterion that we wanted to have at, uh, at the beginning. So uh, the fact that we wanted our um, regret, total regret to go to zero over time, okay? So it matches exactly uh, the same uh, condition of the greedy, of the epsilon greedy, and so forth. Okay, so let's summarize, and then I'm gonna go and show you some examples coming, coming from the real world. So we have seen the K-armed bandit problem, which is basically a formalization of the exploration, exploitation trade-off. And it's very similar to other online optimizations that we talked about during the course. So the stochastic gradient descent, balance that we have seen on Tuesday, and so forth. But it comes with very limited feedback. Like, if you think about SGD, you have the different components of the gradients, you can compute the derivatives and so forth, while here we only have information coming from the different draws of the arm, okay? So we have to do the best possible we can with that limited amount of data. And the interesting thing is that we cover a couple of algorithms that even if simple are able to achieve no regret uh, when time goes to infinity, okay? Any questions or we, we jump to the examples? Question. So it seems like in the limit we hit zero, but what about cases in which like a single mistake can be drastic, like medical cases, for example, if like pulling the banded arm is like prescribing medication? Very good question. So uh, what happens if we are not in the context of ads where uh, missing a click through is not dramatic, but rather we are in a clinical trial and then um, making a big mistake comes to a, to a larger price. Um, so the, the reason why I showed clinical trials at the beginning uh, w was more to tell you that this set of techniques can be applied to those contexts. But clearly, when the, when the regret is much higher compared to the ads, you're not gonna be plugging exactly this kind of uh, technique out of the box. So there, there are other more conservative ways to do it. And that's what I was saying before. Like today, I'm showing you the most optimistic version because it applies very well to ads or to recommended systems on Netflix, for instance. But then in the, in the case of medical trials, you will be doing something much more conservative. Thanks, great question. Anything else or we? We jump to the examples. Okay, okay, so let's go through the example. Um, the first thing I wanted to show you is the following. Um, like many other algorithms in, in computer science, and if you, if you plan to do research in the future or you're already doing that, I always suggest you to do this. Uh, always try to plot what is the theoretical worst case. And in our case, we care about the cumulative regret, okay? That's the quantity that we want to minimize versus the real cumulative regret that, that, you, that you actually get, okay? So let's take this example where we have k is equal to 10, so we have 10 different arms. Uh, we run the simulation for a million rounds, and then we have a uniform distribution that gives us rewards of zero, one, okay? So the interesting thing is the upper bound from the theoretical result that we've seen before goes around up to 14,000, but in reality, the real cumulative regret uh, plateaus very quickly and it's around 2,000, okay? So this simulation is just to show you that uh, multi-arm bandit works extremely well, okay? And it can give you very little regret, and you know, after you have this initial exploration phase, it converges very quickly, and basically, this very low slope that you can see from this part of the plot is the, the fact that every now and then, we try other harms, as we were saying before, right? So the fact that every now and then we still explore. But the price that we're paying for that exploration is extremely little, okay? And that's why the cumulative regret over time goes very quickly to zero. So let's see one, one use case, and this is more related to the recommender system. So think about Pinterest. So Pinterest is this platform where users are um, are preparing uh, boards where they, uh, where they pin different images um, related on different topics or passions or hobbies that they have. And the problem with Pinterest is the fact that 
uh, new pins or also the new ads that are showing on the platform, they, they, not, they don't have enough signal about how good they are, especially at the beginning, right? So there is a new user that joins, creates a new board. How do you know that that board is gonna be interesting for, for other people, okay? And how likely are people to, to interact with that board or with that, uh, with that HUD? So this maps very well to the uh, multi-arm bandit problem that we were seeing. So what we wanna do is we wanna try to maximize the rewards from several unknown slot machines, okay? And our slot machines are basically the, the different uh, pins up there. And we wanna decide which ones we wanna play and which, in which order we want to play them, okay? And so each pin is regarded as an arm and the user engagement are considered as rewards, okay? And this is a very, uh, interesting thing to, to think about. At the end of the day, sure, Pinterest is a company that sustains itself through ads, but what, what is king in this field is the fact that you have a lot of user engagement because you want your platform to grow, you wanna get more users, you wanna get user passionate and interested about the content that you're generating. So this does not apply only to ad, what we've seen today, okay? It can just be used to study how much your content is creating user retention and is creating, you know, user engagement and traffic, okay? And once again here is, we, we wanna find a trade-off between the exploration and exploitation because uh, the risk on this platform will be to always be showing the ads that people are often clicking on. So say uh, you are checking boards about clothing, then there are some brands that everyone has bought at least once in their life and you could be just, you know, hammering the users always with the same brands, okay? And sure, this is, a, this is a technique that will give you some click through rate, but it might trap the system into some local optimal, okay? So that's why you wanna make sure that even with the content that you show to the user, you always strike a, tra a balance between exploration and exploitation, all right? So the solution that they apply to Pinterest is the following. Uh, so they, they apply the standard banded algorithm and what they do is that they observe the, uh, the set of A pins and ads that they have on the platform and then based on the pay payoffs from previous trials, so how many times people clicked or liked certain images, then the algorithm will choose a specific harm that will receive our estimate uh, payoff. And once again, <laughs> I'm gonna keep on repeating this, it's very important to remember that only feedback for the chosen arm is observed, okay? So every time Pinterest makes the choice of uh, ranking down a certain pin or a certain board, then they are not getting information about how much users like or find relevant that content, okay? So that's why every now and then, as we've seen in UCB, you wanna make sure that certain pins or boards are popping up so that you can receive some user feedback, okay? And our algorithm will improve the arm selection strategy after each observation, okay? So that's what we've seen before when we were updating the, the confidence bounds, the more uh, trials we make. Now the difference between all the examples that we've seen before, you know, from the theory and the practice is the fact that in a platform like Pinterest, after the score for a certain pin is very low for a long period of time, they basically filter it out. And the reason is, if you, if you think about it, not only is it expensive to uh, maintain a logging system and collect logs for the millions of users that such a large platform can have, but if every time there is an action, you need to recompute and update a lot of weights, this will become extremely expensive in your, in your architecture. So in terms of computational power that is required to make that happen. So what you do is, in the real world, once you have been sure that something doesn't work very well for a long amount of time, then you filter it out from the potential candidates, okay? Okay, any questions or we jump to, to the next example? Okay, next. So we're gonna be talking about A-B testing. Uh, A-B testing can be seen sort of as a primitive version of multi-arm bandit, okay? Because A-B testing is the following. You, you have a control experiment with two different variants, variant A or variant B. And say you're on a website, part of the traffic of your website will end up on this page, okay? That has a blue button. Then one of your web designers will decide, you know what, I think a green button with an arrow will get much more uh, people clicking or registering on our platform. So you wanna try if the intuition of your web designer is correct or not, 
okay? And that's how you make it happen. You, you, you route part of the traffic on condition A, part of the traffic on condition B, and then you're gonna be computing what is the click rate on that button over time. And if this example sounds trivial to you, um, it's, it's well known that Google, uh, possibly almost 20 years ago, they, they tested 50 different variations of blue for the result page. Uh, this is something that, uh, an experiment that was run by uh, Marissa Meyer, if I recall correctly. So it's, you know, it's one of uh, her pride, proud points uh, back in the days. So the idea there is there are so many different little details that impact the user engagement and the click rates that you really wanna try to test all of them, okay? And that's something that a lot of websites do on a daily basis. And we are all part of this testing. All of us using the web, especially if you go to uh, large platforms, you always are gonna end up into some different conditions. Now, this is a toy example, like the fact that the click rate could be this different, because it's almost 20% of difference, but if you think about Facebook or Google, if, if they can design an experiment that has even a 1% improvement in the click rate when it comes to ads or if it comes to anything else, that's a huge result for them, okay? Like it, it, it's very hard to have such an abrupt change from one condition to another, okay? So if you're ever gonna be working on these problems, unless you're a very small startup, don't expect something, you know, a very big impact with your A-B testing. But the interesting thing here is that you wanna put in row many of them until your interface converges into the most optimal one for your users, okay? Now, where can you apply A-B testing? It's not only on you know, clicking buttons of different colors, uh, but let me give you some, some different examples. So, um, let's say uh, you, want, you, have, you, know, you have to compute the average revenue per paying user, and what you're gonna do is that you assume that the distribution for the, for the average revenue is closer to a Gaussian, then you can apply uh, a, cer a certain type of statistical test. And if you go through these different examples, each one of them can be modeled from a specific probability distribution, and then you kind of find and assign a different statistical test to find out if there is a, a statistically significant difference between your condition A and your condition B, okay? So basically you have to do this homework, find out what is the right distribution for the kind of problem you're modeling, then you run your A-B testing, and if you find out, okay, my condition A outperforms B, then eventually you're gonna be stopping condition B from your platform and you're gonna be running only condition A, okay? So this is the gist of idea of doing A-B testing. It's just testing an hypothesis. Now, um, imagine that you have two different versions of, of the website, and you wanna test which one is better. And you already know that version A has an engagement rate of 5%, while B has a lower engagement rate of 4%. And you want to establish that with 95% confidence that your version A is better. I'm gonna guide you now through different strategies, and I'm gonna be showing you how much they cost in terms of number of observations that you have to collect, okay? And eventually what I'm gonna try to convince you is the fact that A-B testing, as simple and elegant as it is, is much more expensive than what we're seeing today through the multi-arm bandit problem, okay? So in the case of A-B testing, uh, if you go through the mud, you're gonna be needing roughly 22,000 observations, so 11,000 per each arm, so each condition, condition A or condition B, to establish uh, within that confidence um, value if uh, A is better than B. And you're go we're gonna be using a t-test example to establish uh, what is the correct sample size, okay? Now, can we do better with what we've seen today? Can we collect fewer observations still going to the, to the right solution, okay? So, in the case of A-B testing, uh, say your website receives a mere 100 uh, page views per day, uh, then you're gonna be needing more than 200 days to complete this whole test. And if you're a startup, you, you probably cannot afford to wait 200 days to find out you know, what, what is the best UI uh, for your product, okay? So you wanna make this happen much faster. So how do we do that, okay? Um, so let, 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 let's basically use uh, uh, this idea. Uh, so rather than, you know, fixing and statically assigning condition A and condition B, what you could do is that like, 
twice per day, you know, or a fixed amount of times per day, you examine how often each of the variation uh, has been performed. So how often uh, you got, you know, more engagement from one of the uh, two arms, okay? And then uh, you adjust the fraction of traffic that each arm will receive going forward. So you can think about this as some kind of, you know, adaptive routing. Uh, the more uh, you, you receive information about a specific arm, the more you decide how to assign traffic to, to each one of them, okay? And if an arm uh, that appears to be, uh, to be doing well gets more traffic, then the one that is clearly underperforming will receive less traffic, okay? So rather than having this fixed split that you usually get in, in, in A-B testing, we're gonna be trying to adapt the amount of traffic that we send to each arm. And um, an, el an elegant way to do this is called the Thompson sampling. And this is a, another uh, nice result coming from probability theory. And this connects very well to the question that I received before of, uh, ca can we think about this problem with in Bayesian terms? And that's exactly what no, the answer that I was giving to you before, okay? So what, what is Thompson sampling? It basically, what it does is uh, it will assign to, um, to each session, um, basically to, to each arm, a proportion of the traffic. So uh, basically, the, the, the probability that each arm is, uh, is optimal is, is going to be proportional to the, to the amount of traffic that it receives. So how do we formalize this, okay? So we, we take a vector of conversion rates for arms 1 to k. Our conversion rates, again, can be if you're clicking on a certain ad, if you're registering on the platform, you know, like you're, you're on Netflix, you try a, a red interface or a black interface, and then you will be seeing how many users are subscribing on Netflix, and each one of these conditions will be encoded in one of those variables, okay? And each one of those variables works in the following way. So you're basically keeping a count. You're counting how often you get a success divided by all the possible trials, which is nothing but the sum of all the successes and all the failures in that condition, okay? And then we have our vector y, which is all the data observed thus far in the experiment. So if someone is registered or not. And the key part of the Thomson sampling is that you're gonna be having this indicator function that tells you if the, the uh, basically it tells you if the arm A is the optimal arm or not. Now, what is the problem here is that this is some kind of, you know, oracle function. We still don't know if a certain arm is optimal or not, right? Because we, we, we basically gather this information as the experiment goes through. So in theory, you know, you can write the, this expression with the, with the following integral. The problem of this integral is, apart from the fact that, you know, it captures the outcomes, uh, it, it, it captures the success and failure rates and given the outcome observed, is the fact that it cannot be solved in closed form. So we cannot find a clean mathematical way to estimate the different, uh, the different uh, probability, um, the different basically uh, probability, out, the probability distributions of the outcomes for each single arm. So given that we cannot solve it in this way, how can we overcome this problem? we're gonna be doing sampling, okay? So we're, we're gonna be uh, basically using observations and slowly uh, narrowing down what is the, uh, the exact value of the, of the mu's for each single arm. So how, how does this work? Um, so once again, uh, we are basically drawing uh, independent random variables. We, we assume that all our arms are independent. And what we do is uh, we, we model each arm as a better distribution, okay? And our beta distribution will have two priors, the alpha and beta priors, plus you will encode the successes and the failures that we observe up to now on the system. So that's how our beta distribution looks like. So like this is beta of 2,8, it means like two successes and eight failures. It, works, it looks in this way. This is an 8,2, so eight successes and two failures. And this is a 5,5, five, so uh, pretty much almost a, a Gaussian uh, where you have five successes and five failures. So how our sampling looks like, how does it work, okay? Um, basically, for now, you can almost ignore what is the prior assignment, uh, is, is not the, the key aspect of, of the algorithm. What you care about is you're keeping these counters of all the successes and failures for the, for the different arms, okay? So our i is the index of the arm, and then you run the experiment from step one to step capital T, 
So the duration is our usual t. And now for each single arm, rather than running the, uh, the actual experiment, experiment, so rather than pulling it, what you do is you draw a value according to our beta distribution, okay? So we're basically trying to simulate how these harms will behave without actually doing it. And then once we run this initial simulation step, what we do is we actually draw from the arm i, and this will be the arm with the maximum expected outcome, okay? And we are gonna be observing our reward r. Now that we observe our reward, what we do is we're gonna be updating the, either the success count or the failure count for that harm, okay? So what, we, what we're doing here is the following. We're using these beta distributions as a proxy of how an arm will behave without pulling the lever. And then after we run the simulations, we just go and draw from the actual arm and then update our counts, okay? So this allows us basically uh, to just keep very few counts per different options and run the sampling over time. And uh, it gives us yet another strategy to perform the multi-arm bandit, okay? Now, what is the difference between the actual experiment and what, what you, know, you, actually, uh, you do in reality, you do in production? So in our case, what we have to do is that we have to route part of the traffic per each, per each different condition, okay? So you're, again, you're on Netflix, you have the red interface, the black interface, you wanna send part of the traffic to the red, part of the traffic to the black one. So what you do is, first, once again, you, do the, 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 you simulate the draws from our different beta distributions, okay? And you do this over time. You simulate the draws, you simulate which one will give the, the highest reward, and then the values are gonna be updated. Then, the second step is, the probability that arm A is optimal is basically the fraction of the rows where the arm A had the largest simulated value. Because it means that, for instance, in, uh, in row three, arm two is the winning one and it will be drawing for arm two. Then for, uh, from time two, uh, arm three was the highest value, so you will be drawing from here, okay? So you run the simulation and after it's done, you set a portion of the traffic per each arm, okay? So you, try, you set traffic to arm A to be equal to the percentage of wins. And basically this beautifully balances how much traffic you're sending to, to each arm, given what is your expectation of the, of the win rate for that arm, okay? And the reason why this is a very uh, interesting technique is the fact that it's, it's very fast and it's not very expensive to maintain because you just have a, we just have a few counters per different conditions, okay? All right, so now let's, let's put this in number and let's see what, are, what is the difference between uh, standard A-B testing or multi-arm bandit to the Thompson sampling, okay? So the condition is as before, our condition A is 5% engagement rate, B, 4% engagement rate. What we wanna do is we wanna establish within a certain confidence that version A is better. And we said that with A-B testing, we're gonna be needing roughly 22,000 observations, okay? So how much are we gonna be doing better with the bandits? And here is the result. So we're gonna be doing the following. On, on day one, we start in the following way. We, we send basically roughly 50 sessions to each arm, okay? So we have a uniform distribution at the beginning because we don't know which one is gonna be performing best, okay? And now we, we find that A got really lucky, okay? And on the first day, it has roughly like 70% per chance, 70% chance of being the best one, to being superior. And conversely, our band B gets only 30%. So, we accumulate these observations, then we're on day two, and now we can, we can basically send traffic in different ways to the, to the different conditions, okay? So we accumulate all the traffic that we're seeing uh, so far, and once again, we can recompute the probability that each harm is the best. So at every day, or basically at every time, we change the, the, the traffic distribution between the conditions, we are gonna be recomputing our probabilities, okay? And here is what we get. Um, so, these, these are days, our x-axis is in days, is the time period, and uh, on the y-axis you will see the probability of being the optimal strategy. So uh, arm one is, the, is condition A, the 0.4, no sorry, condition B, 0.4, and arm two is the 0.5, and see at the beginning there are some fluctuations, 
because the system takes some time to converge. And then eventually you see that the, the, the worst one, condition B, will, will slowly drop down. And then our condition uh, A will go all the way up to almost 95%. And basically we stop the experiment where we hit the 95%. So when we hit our confidence level. And the interesting thing here is that our experiment finished in just 66 days and we saved roughly 150 days compared to the A-B testing experiment, okay? So it makes things go much faster. And the same technique applies uh, to multiple arms. So this is just a plot where instead of having uh, only two conditions, we have uh, six, if I recall correctly. And once again, you can see you know, at the beginning, there are some fluctuations, different conditions take uh, a certain amount of time to converge. And then after, um, uh, a uh, few hundred days, the, the, the top condition uh, shows up and then um, the web designer can decide basically to get rid of a specific UI and keep only the optimal one. Okay, so I interrupt here the lecture and if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. All right, thanks. See you next week. <laughs>